What is going on? We're back at it again with another episode of True Capacity Talks with your host, James. And today we have a Atlanta, I would say at this point, got to be an Atlanta native, someone that everyone in the health and wellness space in Atlanta knows or knows of, especially knows of her studio. So today we have Elsie Brotherton on the podcast. I want to just kind of open it up first and foremost and uh, ask how you doing. Doing great. Happy to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate you making the time. Um, I want to kind of roll back, right? Today, you're approaching, fast approaching 10 locations for Highland Yoga. You you have Training Collective. You've got a three-year-old. You've got other stuff in the background that's going on. Um, can you talk to me about the time during law school when you jumped into yoga for the first time? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, law school, I think it was uh, my third year of law school, uh, first semester where I was just realizing, first of all, how much my body hurt from sitting and working, um, as law students do. And then also just like, you know, realizing that this chapter was about to come to an end and, you know, having kind of a lot of stress and, uh, just pressure around like entering the job market after law school. Um, and so I decided to go check out a uh, yoga class at the Decatur YMCA. And I found myself in like the silver sneakers class there. Um, so it was like all of these nice older, older ladies. And um, the yoga class was, you know, what I would consider like a beginners, you know, very beginner friendly, but it kicked my ass, which is really funny. Like I literally couldn't do anything in the class, um, but I love the community of these women <laughs> so much. And the teacher was so sweet and I felt amazing from just really basic stretching. Um, like, you know, I think when you're, your body's super locked up, like little things can make a huge difference. So like even that experience for a couple of months was pretty life-changing. And then I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to try something different and started exploring yoga around uh, Decatur primarily, which is where we were living. Um, and, uh, yeah, just found myself checking out all the different studios and the different styles, um, and, you know, started getting really hooked on it. So. So prior to uh, like being in law school, were you doing any kind of fitness? Were you jumping into team sports? Were you doing any intramurals or doing anything else? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I've always been kind of like a gym junkie, but also like like not very well organized in the gym, which like I'm very embarrassed to admit, like I have no fucking clue what I'm doing when I'm in an actual gym. So I would just go in and do like an hour of cardio and like like four weight machines or whatever, <clears throat> like pretty much my whole life. That was kind of like my whole approach to fitness. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sort of still doing that in law school, but, you know, because of time and stress and money, like it wasn't super accessible. So yeah, I just had kind of fallen off a little bit. Um, and yeah, so no, <laughs> to answer your question, not really. I was doing like really lazy, shitty workouts once a week. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, with those, the, as you say, lazy, shitty workouts where you're kind of just stumbling around in there, your physique at the time, like, was it something that you were, you were comfortable with? Do you like, do you like the way that you looked in clothes that you felt, oh. or was it kind of like, uh, I'm trying to run away from this? Um, well, I've always been like kind of naturally athletic looking, even if, like I'm not naturally athletic. So I think I got really lucky in that regard. Um, you know, yeah. So I really discovered fitness, I would say, like in general, like I would discover my bad gym routine in college. So I was a music, uh, I went to music conservatory for undergrad and, you know, I was like literally just playing piano 10 hours a day. And I finally realized that um, I was developing, developing what people call apparently piano butt, which is just like you're sitting at a piano and so your butt's getting bigger. <laughs> and my friend was like, you've got piano butt. You need to start. <laughs> it sounds like it's something like super naughty, but it's like, no, you just have a big butt from sitting all day. It's like um, you need to go start working out. So that's how I discovered my gym routine. Um, and that I feel like helped me kind of maintain and keep my you know piano butt under control and just like maintain basic I don't know, physique. So I wasn't like looking to change my body dramatically or anything like that. But I did like how yoga helped me feel much more empowered in my own body and like comfortable in my own skin. Um, and that was something that was new for me, um, you know, as a young woman, like with all of the same insecurities as, you know, probably many other young women have at the time, like that was pretty life changing to really feel good in my body like that. Now, do you think that that, that good in your body, like, I, I want to kind of unpack that because I think that this is something that a lot of people struggle with when, when you got into yoga and you were like, oh my God, this 
gives me confidence. This makes me feel like I'm strong, like I'm here, like I'm present. Um, was that more like physiologically or was that mental? Like going yeah, so I think it was kind of both. And we talk about this a lot in like our teacher training. So I think developing body awareness is not something that comes naturally for some people. Like I definitely didn't have that. Um, so like, for instance, when you're teaching yoga to someone who's brand new to movement and you're like, lift your right leg, they'll move like their left hand. So it's like there's a brain body kind of disconnect that I think you have to kind of learn. Some people, I think, do dance or more athletics when they're younger and have a better sense of that naturally. But like, for me, I didn't really have that. And so developing body awareness was actually pretty like, just cool on its own to feel like you are, you know, fully embodied, comfortable in your body, like, you know, aware of your body and this kind of meat suit that you're like stuck with for your entire life. It's like pretty much the only thing that you have actually, right? That's enduring. And um, so that was really awesome. That was very empowering. But then also like obviously all the other benefits that come from yoga, like um, the mindfulness meditation and just like getting really comfortable being with myself and being with my thoughts. Like that is that is the practice of yoga, you know, and then deciding what you like and what you want to keep and deciding that it's okay to let go of some things. Right. So like, I think learning that kind of practice, um, at a really stressful time in my life was super important, like in the backdrop of all of this. Um, so my business partner now is my ex-husband and we met in law school. And at the time, um, like our last year, our second to last year of law school, his very best friend growing up got a terminal cancer diagnosis. So he was in Texas. And so like, we were kind of trying to decide what to do, um, knowing that like, you know, his best friend, like a brother to him was about to go through this like deeply traumatic journey. So we, um, I, I think like a lot of my stress was coming from that. Um, and, you know, we eventually moved to Texas, like after law school to spend time with him. Um, and, you know, yoga was uh, just like a key part of me being able to get through that and and learn from it and be okay on the other side, I think. Um, so yeah, yoga, awesome. Everyone should do it. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's uh, there's maybe a predisposition for people to believe that, you know, oh, well, big, big muscly men in the gym don't like yoga. They shouldn't go to yoga. It's a, it's a, oh it's a women's thing. But what it was interesting to me is I only say that to say that I think that we've got it all wrong. I think that first of all, everyone can benefit from yoga. And, and second of all, most of the time at, at, from the outside, and I'm not a yoga instructor, the people that need it the most are also the people that think that they need it the least think that they don't need to touch it at all. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the mindfulness meditation stuff, like in theory, you can get that from anything. Like if you're just like, Hey, I'm going to put my phone away. I'm going to put all my stuff away. I'm just going to sit here for an hour and like, look at my brain, like look at my mind and like explore this. Like you can totally do that. I think the yoga class environment makes it a lot easier to do that. Like someone's telling you to do it, you know? Um, and there are all these other things that are happening that make it like just easier to tap into that space. So I think like in general, everyone in the world could benefit from mindfulness, like 100%. And there are many ways to get there. Um, yoga is a, is a way that makes it more accessible. I would say from the physical standpoint, I agree, like <laughs> really muscly guys need to do yoga. Like it's all about just keeping balance in your body. Like one thing that's cool about yoga is that like the practice is super symmetrical. So like what you do on one side, you do on the other side mm -hmm. and it's very balance oriented. Like there, there's strength and there's, but there's obviously also a lot of stretching, which you're not getting in traditional like weight lifting. Um, and then there are kind of like micro muscles that get used that are not necessarily something that you target and it's like CrossFit for instance. Right. So I think from just like a physical perspective, like the cross training that comes from yoga is hugely beneficial. Now, if you do yoga every day, all day, like you're going to have other physical problems, right? Because it's not perfectly balanced either. Like there's no pulling involved in yoga. There's no weight bearing exercises. Like, you know, there's, there are a lot of like, you're overstretching your hamstring. So I think like, for me, as I get older, I'm realizing, like, as far as my body goes, like, it's all about finding balance and doing what feels good. Um, and yoga is like a huge part of that for me. So I probably practice yoga like three or four times a week. But then I also now hit the gym twice a week and do like, I try to do like, you know, traditional kind of like zone two cardio, I try to do weightlifting and counterbalance the things that really don't get hit in my yoga practice, or which like, I'm actually having overuse injury issues from so like pulling and hamstring curls. So yeah. Yeah. No, I think that it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing that someone that is um, legitimately queen yoga is willing to stay 
we're willing to say that that yoga is not the end all be all that yoga by itself should not be the only thing that anybody does i think that that's a beautiful thing that you're willing to admit and probably that kind of open mindedness is why you've had the almost meteoric rise right in the uh in the space that you have with all of your your locations right i think that there's there's a lot of things that carry over there um and i think that that's that's something that most people wouldn't admit. Like most people in CrossFit are not going to say you need to do anything other than CrossFit. Same with Orange Theory, F45, yoga, Pilates. Reformer is all you sure. need. Like well, I used to be a purist and then I hurt myself. I mean, look, mm -hmm. I do yoga primarily for the mental benefit, I would say at this point. Like the physical stuff, you can get that in different ways once you've been practicing for a long time. But um, I don't know. It just feels good. I think life is all about balance. The older I get, I'm just like, you got to find balance in every part of your life. You can't do too much of one thing. And that's that goes for physical you know, professional, like everything. Yeah. And I, I want to, I want to kind of roll back to something that you said about doing yoga when you were in law school, right. When all this other stuff was happening. I mean, yeah. you know, you said something along the lines that, that yoga kind of helps you work through the things to release what you need to, you know, to go uh, this direction or that direction. Um, at what point when you were starting your practice in yoga, did you know that, Hey, law is not something that you're going to do long-term? Well, I think I probably knew that you know, from day one of law school, but, you know, when you worked really hard to get somewhere and also coming out of like music. So when I was in undergrad, I was at a music conservatory, as I said, and like, I basically just injured myself from practicing piano too much. So I came out of school with like no real, like really nothing in a lot of ways. Like I, I couldn't play my instrument and I hadn't really had a real like traditional undergrad education. So I needed to go to grad school, but I also hadn't taken math, you know, since like 10th grade because I was at like music boarding school and conservatory for piano, um, where literally all I did was play piano. Like it's crazy. Um, so, you know, law school was a really good option because I could take the LSAT and do really well on it. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up there. I was like, I just want a professional degree where I can have a job afterwards. And I remember going in to like law school, this kind of naive moron, <laughs> like, I don't know how old I was, like 22 or 23 um, and like the first day they were like, all right, so where does everyone want to work after this? Like a law firm, a big law firm, a small law firm or a nonprofit. And I was like, I don't think I want to do any of those things. Um, and so I kind of knew right away I wasn't a good fit, but you know, I was there and I'd spent a lot of money and time to get there. So I just gave it my all, you know, worked my ass off in law school. And then, you know, it was kind of like, okay, well, let's just see what happens once I start practicing law. So I clerked for a judge which was an awesome experience. Like, I really love that. Um, and then I started practicing law in Dallas and I was like, oh God, this is not for me. Now the practice area I was in was like particularly brutal. Um, my practice area was personal catastrophic personal injury insurance coverage. So like representing the insurance companies to deny coverage for like terrible, terrible things like people getting crushed or like legs being burned off. Like just, you know, it was not, it was not fulfilling from like a kind of existential perspective, I would say. And then the work was also very stressful. Um, and so it just that that wasn't so like doing that job while simultaneously being at like the deathbed of this guy who's like 32 years old, who's just like slowly dying. Like it kind of was like someone came up to me and just like shook me really hard and was like, wake up, like you're going to die one day too, asshole, <laughs> you know? And like, you should do something you love. You should do something you care about. At very least you should do something that you don't hate doing every day. So I think that was, that was a big moment for me. Um, realizing that like, okay, like I, I have learned a lot from this experience, you know, but there's something else out there for me. It was post recession still at the time. And, you know, because of my background with music and law, I was not super qualified to do many other things other than <laughs> be a lawyer. <laughs> so I had a really tough time finding a non-law job, honestly. And I applied to a lot of jobs. I didn't have a, a, any very good guidance on that either. I think that was a big part of it, but it kind of became clear to me that my best option was going to be to start a business. And at the time I was, you know, doing yoga like obsessively because it was such a, it was my kind of crutch. It was like my coping mechanism during this otherwise like very stressful, you know, couple of years in our lives. Um, and 
you know, I just decided like this could be it for me. Like, I love this. I've, I've always wanted to start my own business. I kind of have to start my own business if I want to do something else. I have exactly enough money, I think, to do this. And so it's crazy because we're coming up on like the 10 year anniversary of like when I decided that was what I was going to do. And um, like looking back on it, that was pretty big hard decision to make. Like, I think now I have a lot more to lose and it would be really tough to say like, Hey, throw away everything you've worked for and start over and take a chance on something that is not guaranteed, you know? Um, and yeah, I got to look back and give myself a ton of credit for that decision because that was not easy, but also it was very right. And I think like, what I've learned from that is like, you also need to listen to your heart, like really basic stuff. Like when something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't, you know? And, um, you know, you got to go with your gut sometimes and just jump to me. It was like jumping out of a burning building. Like I had to go somewhere. I had to take the jump at some point, you know, um, and just being brave and doing that. So I don't know if that was like the longest answer to your question ever, but yeah, I think it's a hell of an answer. It's an honest answer. And, um, I, I think that that's, that's what I was looking for. Um, when you were in, in Dallas, right. Practicing law, you get out of that, you realize, it's like someone shook you, right, and kind of woke you up from a, a bad dream. Like I gotta, I gotta change this. At the time, with that, um, that was your ex husband, right? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You were there with. Were you married at that time? Yeah, we got married in 2013. Okay, so we got married in 2013. Can Can you walk me through how the hell you went from clerkship, right, with a the judge there, married, while watching someone? basically die in front of you to then back in Atlanta in 2015, opening up a studio. Yeah. Yeah. So we knew, so I lived in Virginia Highlands um, during law school and after kind of doing my big year of yoga, like my last year of law school, you know, it became clear that this area really didn't have a studio that was convenient. Um, It was also before power yoga was a thing really. It was before core power had opened here before there was like a true power yoga studio. Um, that was just power yoga. And that's what I like to practice. Can you, can you define that for everyone, everyone that, that doesn't know what that is? Yeah, power yoga. So I feel like it gets it gets a bad, bad name because like people are like, oh, that's athletic yoga. That's fitness yoga. And like what we do at Highland Yoga is definitely like fitness oriented, but also like we do incorporate mindfulness meditation. Like it is a it is a yoga experience. Um, It's not just a workout. But, you know, if I'm going to spend an hour doing anything, if I'm so busy and needs to check a lot of boxes, like I want to feel really like good in my body and like I got to work out when it's over. Or, um, you know, I want to feel well rested. I want to feel like I got my meditation. So power yoga is d- like traditionally just like a fa- kind of faster place, pace, more athletic style of yoga. I think, you know, to keep it really simple. Um, so yeah, there's no power yoga in Atlanta. So, you know, I was like, I think this would be the perfect spot for us, like in Virginia Highlands. And so there were a lot of challenges there because I was, bar- I had, I took the Texas bar and in the law world, it's kind of hard if you're like a brand new lawyer to be like, oh, I'm just going to switch jobs now. I'm going to just move to another state and start another law job. Like every law firm wants you to say you want to be there for your entire career. And, you know, they want to see you be somewhere for at least like three or four years before you move to your next job. So there were a ton of challenges there. And so like, I just got really, really lucky. I fought really hard to get a position at us at a law firm in um, Atlanta. And I, they like turned me down for the job. And it was like a really shitty experience. And then like, two days before I was about to call everything quits, they were like, actually, we really need you here. And we need you here in like three weeks. So I like, got my stuff together and like moved. And then I also took the Georgia bar with like two weeks to study, which was crazy. Um, and then I started practicing law here and my, uh, ex-husband, like he had been doing some kind of like non-law, like some internship or something. He was not in a good place because he had gone through like a really traumatic experience with his friend. So we were kind of just like in survival mode too. Um, but we were able to move back here just like, like, so like, luckily, like, I can't believe that opportunity came to us. Um, And so we moved back here, I was practicing law, and we had found a space in Virginia Highlands that ended up being Highland Yoga ultimately. Um, But, you know, it was kind of like, it's hard to describe because there were so many just lucky, unrepeatable circumstances that happened in that like eight critical eight month period that allowed us to do this studio. Um, And I'll never forget like the night before we signed the lease, like in November of 2014, like, you know, (laughs) We were like at hand in hand. I don't know if you remember that place on North Highland next to neighbors. 
we were sitting there and talking about it and we we're like, should we do this? Like, this is really scary. We could lose everything because like truly you sign a personal guarantee for a commercial lease where like they do come and take your house you know like if it doesn't work out um and I'd never really taught yoga before and I'd never run a business you know so I was like what the fuck are we doing and I remember I actually threw up in that restaurant like thinking about it I got so anxious I just like puked um and then we signed the lease and you know we we're off to the races getting our space open and like we literally had exactly enough money down to like, I think the day we opened, we had like $5,000 left in our bank account. Like, you know, we were like, we were cutting it really close, which by the way, people listening, do not do that. Do not open a business with not enough money and not enough experience. Like do your, do better due diligence than I did because it will make it a lot easier and a lot less stressful and a lot less dependent on like luck of the circumstances. Like, you know, us being the only studio in the area, you know, the only studio doing power yoga in Atlanta, like just, just set yourself up for success, do more due diligence, do more, you know, like learning and information gathering before you jump into this, like very scary thing. Cause it was stressful. Like the day we opened no money, taught my first yoga class basically ever, you know, realized like, Oh shit, I have a lot to learn about this, <laughs> you know, like tried to figure out marketing and sales and all these things that are required to have a successful business. And it was, it was a lot. And in the first six months that we were open, I was, um, working full time at my law firm and then like as a litigator and then teaching every 6 a.m. class, every 615 class, every 730 class, every single weekend class, like just working around the clock, like to a point where I actually don't even remember most of that. Like, I think I like, you know, basically didn't sleep and, you know, (laughs) it was really stressful. And then as soon as we started making money, I remember we made like $5,000, $5,000, you know, after being open for six months. And I was like, I'm quitting my law job. I'm going to do this full time now, you know, like, let's go. And, but you know, it, it was true. Like the second I was able to put all of my energy into the business and like all of my attention, that's when things really started to click. So like, you know, I'm, I'm glad I kind of kept us in a safe, like stable kind of revenue place with my job and, you know, everything for the time that I could, but I'm also really grateful that I made that choice to, to just go full time with it because that's when we started to really grow and succeed and I could, I could make it a good business. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's a lesson that a lot of people have to learn on their own and you got to pay the ignorance tax on right there. Uh, either jumping in with nothing to your name and trying to figure it out and be super stressed or, um, you know, by, I guess by the luck of the draw at that time, you keeping your job and maintaining that. I mean, the first time that I started a business, I wish that I would have done that and not just jumped in and said, this is going to work because I know I can do it. I wish I would have waited a little bit longer because it, you know, some of those opportunities probably would have extended further uh, because I wasn't like so up against the wall. Yeah. I think that's really great advice. Like I, I am all for like following your dream in taking chances and risks, but they need to be calculated and you need to have a backup plan you know, and like, if you want something bad enough, you kind of need to, you need to make that work. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you can really fuck yourself, honestly, <laughs> like, or just not fulfill your potential, you know, by not doing all the due diligence and being careful about it. So yeah, I love, I love that. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's something that a lot of people that are on the outside that are big theory people, right. That haven't started a business that are like, well, you should do it this way. Or you should do it that way. You don't really have yeah. an idea until you, uh, you look at your bank account and it says zero and you have payroll coming up, right. Until you got to pay yes. other people and you have no money to pay them out of. You're like, uh, this is, this is all fun and fun and well until then. Um, yeah. but yep. I, I guess from the, from the time that you opened, so 2015, you open in Virginia Highland, right. And at that time, you're still married to your ex-husband, right? Is that is that the case? Yes. Okay. By the way, he's an awesome guy. He's still my business partner. We're like we work really well together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm only I'm yeah. I'm only just trying to get the uh, you know the timeline the straight here. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and because I want to, I want to ask, I think a lot of people have this notion that you know you shouldn't do business with family, you shouldn't do business with partners, you shouldn't do business with yada yada unless you can point to a few people that are uber famous that have done it very at a very high level like what when did y'all decide to go your your separate ways as as humans right in the marriage and yeah. stay business partners because that to me is extremely fascinating that y'all stayed business partners and y'all have excelled as business partners 
Oh my gosh. That's a great question. I hope he, I hope he never listens to this. Okay. So first of all, to your point of like, you shouldn't do business with family. I kind of disagree in the sense that like, you know, your family the best and you can kind of generally, I would say, trust your family more, I would hope than you know, maybe just a friend. Um, and I have found like, being in business with John, like, because in a way we still are family, you know, um, we were married, like, you know, I know him better than I know so many other people. And I, I know that I can trust him in a very deep way that I think is hard to replicate, um, unless you've just like known someone for a really long time. So I would kind of challenge that a little bit. That said, you know, family is also tough. So <laughs> with anyone you're going in business with, you need to be really careful. You need to be really intentional. You need to make sure everyone's on the same page and communication and transparency with among partners is like, like, just like a marriage, like, you know, a business relationship is almost more intense, I would say, than a marriage. And I would say, because of that, like, you know, okay, so like with my ex-husband, you know, I think we were meant to come together for a reason for this, like for Highland Yoga, like in a way. Um, he's a great partner and he's always been my cheerleader and like down to do what I want to do. Like my idea is like he does not ever say like, this is a risk, this is too risky, or this is stupid, or I'm going to really fight. He's like, I just trust you. Like, I see that you have good instincts. And like, you only, you know, I'm here to take a chance with you. And like, I am very lucky that I have that. Like, I think many, many people said, no, you're crazy. When I told them about like, <laughs> I was opening a yoga studio, like a lot, pretty much everybody was like, you're insane, you know? Um, and they've said that about a lot of things that we've done with Highland Yoga that have ended up being pretty awesome. Um, and so I think like finding someone who's a cheerleader like that and who believes in you and who can help you like truly assess a, an opportunity or a situation and give you like honest feedback, like that's really invaluable. I think family is a good place to look for something like that potentially um, because they care about you the most um, and they know you the best. So anyway, um, but all that is to say, like, you know, we're good business partners for that reason, but we're just not great being married together. And I almost think it's like this experience with Highland Yoga was so intense for us that our relationship became Highland Yoga, you know? And I would say that's one word of caution for people who are starting a business with their spouse. Like you, like, I, I think, and I'll take a lot of the fault for that because my, like, you know, I'm in like one one gear like all the time you know what I mean or like I'm go I'm going at like 100 miles an hour all the time and like that's dangerous for a marriage when some one person is so hyper focused on something and like like obsessed with it almost and like it was all consuming for me I wanted it to succeed so badly you know and I think like I was willing to sacrifice our marriage for that you know for better or for worse like that's I, I've been a tough thing to examine honestly and learn from um but I also just think it's true like you know, the person you meet in your twenties might not be the person you're with for the rest of your life. And like, you get to know yourself and you change and you learn and you grow, you know, in your twenties and your thirties. And like, I think, I don't know, it's, I guess it's tough to talk about this on a podcast. Like, you know, I learned a lot from it and I think he has too, but anyway, all that is to say like Highland Yoga is so special and so valuable that like, you know, I think we were really careful with that. Like we didn't want to blow up the business just because we were getting our marriage wasn't, you know, 100% what it, what we wanted it to be, you know? Um, so we fought really hard to keep it like a running really smoothly, which it did. And then also like not make our divorce, you know, negotiations. So like, you know, I don't know. Um, like we try to keep it like, you know, as peaceful, of a transition as we could, you know, and like, we didn't hire lawyers. We just talked about everything and made a plan of what we wanted it to be like, you know, when it was over on the other side and we honored that. And like, I think the lesson from that is like communication and like radical honesty and authenticity, like around these things, these hard things. Um, and, you know, we came out on the other side, like basically, okay. Now I will say like, that year was really shitty. It was really tough. It was tough for everybody. Um, and divorce is really hard. Like I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Although at the same time, I learned so much about myself and grew so much that I do wish that everyone had the opportunity to do that kind of personal development and growth, like in their thirties. Like, I think it's a, it was a really cool opportunity in a lot of ways. And I don't think I 
would have done that if we hadn't gotten a divorce. So I don't know. I, I think also just big picture, like in my life, there's no wasted experience and like pretty much everything that I've gone through, even if it was like a worthless piano performance degree or a divorce, like something awful, like you can learn so much from it and like have it inform the rest of your life. Um, I don't know. So I hope that answers your questions. Marriage is hard. Divorce sucks. Like, you know, but be kind, be, you know, transparent, communicate, be honest, be loving, like all these things that yoga teaches you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I I mean, my, my curiosity there, you know, what, what you just said kind of sparks, wh- where did you learn to be open-minded? Where did you learn to have compassion? Where did you learn to be able to see someone, someone else's side of the, of the situation? Like that is not something that I think that we walking around day to day, everyone has right. Yeah. The ability to, I mean, to detach. Sure. That's a great question. I mean, I would credit yoga primarily like that kind of mindfulness, like, you know, your reality isn't the only reality, you know, like yeah. people have different perspectives, like, you know, really examining like your own motivations and your own stories about things. And then really trying to have empathy and compassion for other perspectives and views. You know, I think that is, that is yoga mindfulness, um, practice, I would say. Um, and, uh, I also think, you know, John to his credit, like he's a great communicator like he almost like over communicates, um, which in this situation was wonderful. And like, he, um, he's a very compassionate and empathetic person himself. So I think like, you know, we're really lucky, like it could have gone many different ways. And it would have really sucked for the business because we had built something very special and valuable at that point. And like, you know, it meant a lot to both of us to keep it intact. Do you think that you'd be approaching your your 10th studio right now? Had you and him not handled it the way that you did? No, definitely not. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, definitely not. Like, I don't think we would have survived a year, you know, if we had been really, um, you know, if it had been like a super combative um, divorce, like, I think we could have just totally blown it up and it would be gone. We wouldn't have Highland Yoga right now. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad that y'all didn't blow it up, right? You're uh, you're a staple in the Atlanta, in the Atlanta world, you know, like there's, you're, you're little everywhere right? Your, your Highland yogas are all over the place and you have tons of beautiful people inside and out that work for you. Uh, oh my that God. That is that- such an understatement. We've got the best team. Like, I just have to say like at this point, so much of the business is just like awesome, awesome people, awesome community, like who care, who show up, who work hard, who want to make it, you know, an amazing experience. So yeah, shout out to the team. Y'all are the best. How did you, so you, you and John separate, y'all continue to go down, um, building Highland yoga, right? How, how much time was between Virginia Highlands to Buckhead to then Decatur Memorial? Like what is the cascading? Was it every two yeah. years, one year? What would that look like? Well, and there is a pandemic in there. So we opened Virginia Highlands in February, 2015. Mm-hmm. We decided we wanted to expand that fall and there was an opportunity in Grant Park Um, so we opened our grand park studio in 2016. Um, we realized we loved opening yoga studios and we were like, Buckhead would be a great market for us. And, you know, found an opportunity in Buckhead. So that was 2017. Um, and you know, let's see in 2018, we got a divorce in 2019. Um, we got approached about moving our, um, grand park location, I think I actually don't remember really when that happened, but we, yeah, we were able to move Decatur or move Grand Park to Memorial. And I remember we did that build out. We opened that build out like two weeks before COVID hit. So, and then there was like a flood in there. It was kind of a hot mess, but I'm really glad we made that move because that look, I love that location. I think it's like amazing in there. Um, But yeah. And then we had signed a lease for Decatur, like, maybe it was in like 2018. It was early. And that development took a long time for them to build. Um, Like things were delayed. And we started the build out like maybe in January of 2020. And so when COVID hit, we were like halfway through that. And we were like, well, we should just finish it because we're halfway through. And like, either this is going to be much better on the other side, or we're totally fucked no matter what. Um, so yeah, that's how we ended up with Decatur. I think in 2018 or 19, we had also signed Brookhaven, 
which is crazy because that film took forever. <laughs> like honestly, a long. I mean, they did a great job with it, but whew. um, you know, and then also in twenty twenty one, we had an opportunity to take over a location on the west side. Um, so we open on west side and like. So Decatur, September 2020, Westside, I think was like June 21. And then 2022, it was kind of just like prep and like, yeah, planning. Um, and then Brookhaven, we knew was going to hit this year. Um, Sandy Springs, like someone's like, oh, you should open in Sandy Springs. I was like, ah, I don't know if we want to do that. But um, the space came to us. It was like a great opportunity. Like, we saw, we had a vision for it. It was kind of already built out for fitness. We were like, oh, why don't we just go for it? It's not going to be too expensive to do this. Um, and we've got a great community already up there that wants to see us. Um, so we did that. That opened um, April, April 24th or April, like April 6th this year. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. In the meantime, last year, I was like, I want to launch a franchise program. I'm going to franchise Highland Yoga. So we spent the whole year like developing our franchise program, which by the way, is like, not for the fan of heart. That's a really challenging thing to do. Got all of our resources ready. Um, you know, lawyers have signed off and everything. We launched the program, had a lot of people circling, like probably 50, 50 people who were like really excited about opening a Highland Yoga. And it just became clear to me, like I was just not up for the task of like helping someone recreate this because it's actually a pretty nuanced experience. And there are a lot of complicated moving parts, like scaling yoga teachers is really tough. Um, and I just made me feel uncomfortable enough that like, we decided not to do it ultimately, but we had had two territories kind of in the process of negotiating their leases. And so we ended up taking those spaces, um, or those areas for, for like corporate expansion. So one was Alpharetta, um, in downtown Alpharetta, and then one was in, um, Athens. So yeah, that's how we ended up doing four studios this year. <laughs> one, we signed a lease in 2019. One was kind of a random opportunity that looked cool. And then the two others were like, you know, what were going to be the first franchise locations that we decided would be better fit for corporate locations. So yeah. Boom. Walk me yeah. back to, to the pandemic, right? Oh, I yeah. was not a gym owner or a a manager of a gym at the time I was a coach, but, um, I was yeah, literally what were doing, what were you doing before you started your, your business? Um, a lot of things. I was in the ad world doing photo video. Um, a few years before that I was in law enforcement. <laughs> I was, wow. uh, I was at a sheriff's office with no okay. hair on my head and, um, basically a shaved head. Uh, before that I was also in Athens. Um, and so I've kind of like bounced around uh, a bit, right. The, um, the pandemic was was interesting because I didn't even move to Atlanta until I guess it was August of 2020, like the middle of COVID happening. So I haven't been here that long. But um, all that to say that I was just a, a, a gym goer, right? I was just a, a member during the middle of the pandemic. Um, I was doing all kinds of coaching outside of that on my own, right? Online and in person, but outside of the gym space, kind of like concierge vibes, like pull up with my car with, with some equipment and we're like doing some private stuff. So um, was doing that. How was the pandemic? Like, how the heck did you keep all of these locations alive and continuing to push forward when, right? A little bit of context that probably a lot of people don't know, you know, your corporate leases, right? Your, um, your commercial leases are not letting you out of paying rent, right? There's no help from the government for you. Like there was with individuals, right? Only if you, if you had employees at the time, you might get, um, some PPE or something else, but with a ton of locations and massive complexity and getting, you know, probably some denials, maybe some approvals, like how the heck did you keep all of these locations up and running so that you could get out of the other side of this? Yeah, that's, it was really tough. It was really tough. And I hope to never have to go through something like that again, honestly, because I was also pregnant. I was like 14 weeks pregnant when COVID hit. Oh, it's bad. Um, yeah. So, you know, when COVID hit and we had to sh close down, um, we had very luckily already, s we had an online platform that I set up in October, 2019, which like just for fun, cause I was bored and that ended up saving our ass <laughs> because we could transition everyone right into digital, like ASAP. There was no like lag time there. 
That said, there were a lot of logistics to figure out. Like, obviously, you know, we lost most of our members, like people just canceled, but we were able, I think because we have like such a cool community that's so invested in their practice and in our team and our community um, that like, I think just barely enough people stuck with us that we were able to get through it. Um, We got PPP, which helped. Um, I think we got two rounds of PPP which obviously really, really helped. Um, we we're, you know, our landlords, I think a few gave us like some concession where we could pay it back at the end of our lease term or something like that. Like, you know, we just, we just got really scrappy and we just did, every, we explored every possible revenue avenue. Like, you know, we, <laughs> we worked really hard to get through that. And I mean, I think we also had the benefit of having generally like a leaner management team. Um, like a lot of these bigger studios, I think that had just like a lot of people to support on payroll. It was harder for them. Um, I mean, I guess they just laid people off, but we didn't, we really didn't want to do that. We had, we have mostly like uh, part-time yoga teachers. And then I think at the time we had like three or four full-time teachers and one or two full-time management. Um, so we just like kept our full-time people like um, basically working as much as possible. And our part-time people, like, thank God, they all pretty much had other jobs that for the most part were not really disrupted by COVID. Um, so yeah, we just got really scrappy. We just tried everything, you know, kept pushing really, really hard. As soon as we could open, we opened with like a ton of, you know, the COVID safety precautions, like tried to navigate that as best possible, knowing that literally everyone on the planet has a totally different perspective and understanding of like, you know, their comfort level with COVID, their kind of information level, like it changed every day. So just being like relentless about, you know, responding to that stuff and, you know, just having a lot a shill of grace <laughs> among for ourselves you know through all of that because it was it was really tough it was really really draining um and then having a newborn you know was like really up there with just things like I don't want to go through again like a pandemic a struggling business and a newborn like I'll just never forget that it was it was really rough and like my response to all the stress was to just do more so that's kind of where training collective got born I was like oh I really need to think about something else right now because this shit is so stressful so I started just kind of exploring some other different business opportunities that's when I got my real estate license and you know it was really fun for me to actually just go out and meet real estate clients and sell real estate. Like I love real estate. I love real estate investing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I ended up with this other work. And then I was like, Oh, I actually love just building businesses. I think this is my why this is what I'm really good at, you know? Um, so got excited about that. And, um, yeah, I don't know. That was, that helped with morale a lot, frankly, you know, to have some other, some other outlets. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, what do you think the biggest lesson that, that COVID, that the pregnancy plus the business plus the PPP plus the relationship at the time. Like, what do you think the, like the, the biggest lesson that you could pull from all that would be? Oh man, I think there are a lot of lessons. I mean, I think one thing I learned about myself, which I think I already knew is that I'm very resilient and very resourceful. Um, and like, uh, I can like really count on myself to like show up when it, really needs to happen. I think I learned a lot as a leader during that. I'm still figuring out really exactly what I learned there. I think as a society, like, I think a big, like, lesson slash warning there is that we need to take much better care of each other. Um, Community really matters. And I feel like we kind of lost that during COVID. And it was it was scary and stressful. So like, how can we show up better for each other in our communities? Honestly, like, yeah. I don't know. I'm still learning. I'm still processing. What can I say? <laughs> I hear you there. Well, it sounds like you're uh, you're you're right on the path. I mean, you got you got all kinds of things moving. Training collective specifically though, outside of Highland, like how has that gone? You and I spoke about it before the build out was even done. When you just had mock ups, when you had potential comps for trainers, like you and I have not talked about it since then. Like, what does it look like from from the conversation we had at Muchacho to now? You know, it really doesn't look that different, honestly. I think, okay, so like the original concept of Training Collective was like a co-working space for trainers and have it just be personal training. 
And as we got into it, like, I think things we've learned, and I'm curious about your experience with training is that like, you know, with training, it's all about client acquisition and like the churn rate or like, you know, your, you know, clients don't do personal training for like five years and a lot of them will do it for like three months. Right. So it's all about just like your client acquisition, at least for us, that's been the biggest challenge is like, you know, it's expensive. A lot of people budget for it for three to six months. It's not like something they're doing like a yoga membership or even a gym membership, right. Where it's just like going to run for the rest of their lives or whatever. Um, so that's been, I think the biggest challenge I would say though, the model hasn't changed that much. I would say like the one thing that's different is that training collective is not just like a place for personal training where you can go and have like an amazing training experience, um, and get connected with a trainer for as long or as little as you want. Um, but we also are like a really fancy, sexy gym, which for me, like selfishly, that's one of my favorite parts. Like I love going to that gym and working out because it's so relaxing and like the energy in there is so good. I think some of that's our community of trainers who really care about the business and who work their asses off to like make it awesome there. Um, but then also like just the gym itself is cool. Like I love how it turned out. I love the community that's there. Like I always just have a great time just working out there. It's like, I don't know. It's kind of like a fancy snap fitness maybe. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And it's a lot of women. I think that's another thing that's unique about training collective is for whatever reason, maybe because like I use a lot of women in our marketing or something, or I'm a woman and I kind of designed it with that in mind. Like it's very, it's like, there's a lot of female energy in there, which is kind of different, you know, for a gym, I would say. Um, so yeah, the model's kind of the same, lots of, you know, co-working for personal training still happening, but then also like, you can just go and be a gym member and have a great gym experience. Yeah, I would say a lot of the reason why there's a lot of women in there is because the women that you do have in there that are trainers are strong as shit and nice. post themselves lifting weights, right? Like they, they're crazy. Do you the, follow the, like Ashley Rees, Aaron? The, the three or four it. girls that I know that are in there that train clients in there that also in there and, and work out. I know them. Not only do they have other, are they involved in dance and yoga and what have you, but they're moving heavy ass weights, single leg, single arm, unilateral work, like doing what people would be like, oh, that's what guys do in the gym. Like they're, they're showcasing that. And so I think that it's a, a much more comfortable environment for women that want to lift like that to come yeah. in and, and do because there's not people pointing, staring, whatever, because the culture is already set that that's what happens here. Yeah. And so no, I, I think that's that totally true. I love that. And thanks for sharing that observation too. And I'll, I'm going to have them listen to this. <laughs> yeah. It's um, I, I think it's, it's different, right? Like, and, and I think it's interesting that you said that it's like a, like a high end snap fitness, because I think snap has kind of the, you know, I guess, I don't know about the Inman one, but the one in Glenwood park, right. It's the one that I go to, um, it's open, right. You have like a bodybuilding side and then you have like a more functional fitness side, yeah. but it's not as clean as your gym. It's not as bright as your gym, right? It doesn't look like there's as much communication going on as your gym over at Training Collective. But the layout from just what I've seen through the walkthroughs and the, the content that y'all post at Training Collective, uh, it's pretty open, like pretty open floor plan, right? You have an area where people can clean and jerk and snatch if they want, or they can be in a in a power rack and or on a, on a cardio equipment, you know, like it's kind of like not one size fit all, but there's something for everyone here. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. I love, I love the layout. I love our equipment. Like I love the, like the branding is really consistent throughout the whole gym. Like, you know, we only order black uh, machines. Everything has to be black in there or it has to be white. So heck yeah. <laughs> there's no I mean, gray workout equipment and training collective. <laughs> staying on brand out here, staying on brand. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. as far as like, compared to your, your Highland yogas, right? So, you know, like we said, we're, you're approaching 10, right? You've got a lot of experience and you've seen membership. You probably understand your churn. You probably understand your retention, your acquisition, the cost, like cost of goods sold, everything on the business front on that. And you probably have a good handle on what that looks like, you know, place to place on, on the Highland yoga side. How does that compare to training collective though, from a business perspective? I mean, it's kind of similar. I would say like, you know, our staffing is really different because, you know, the trainers are kind of running their own business um, and we're not paying them to teach a yoga class, like to teach, you know, we're not, we don't have like, you know, 200 yoga classes on the schedule a day or, or a week or whatever. So like, 
I think the staffing is the difference. Um, otherwise, like, you know, it's a fitness business. A lot of similarities, like the marketing is pretty similar. Like, you know, it's membership based, um, like our gym memberships, you know, we sell training memberships. So it's, it's membership based, um, sales marketing, really similar. Like I would say training collective is a lot easier because it, you know, the trainers are running their own businesses and taking care of their clients and handling that side of communication. And then otherwise it's an open gym for clients to come and go. Um, so you just don't have the same kind of client issues or not issues, but like just client questions and, you know, just things that come up, you know, that we do for yoga, like, you know, I don't know, operations a little, a little different for sure, but you know, a lot of overlap. I don't know if that answers your question. Do you <laughs> similar you're but different? <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Um, do you have is it two levels of membership? Like, hey, you've got personal training, like one on one training, and then you've got, you know, more just open gym, um, plus any kind of group classes, or is it, hey, you've got three on one level, like small group and then one on one or one on one small group and then Yeah. So there are two journeys, um, mm -hmm. you know, gym or training. And you can do either or you can do both. The training, we've got like training memberships where it's like you can sign up to do four 60 minute sessions a month. Um and it's like recurring. So um, you know, instead of paying up front for like a 10 session or whatever, you're just paying monthly, which is really cool. Like that's how I like to do it. Um, and then, you know, if you want to add on gym for that, you get like a discounted rate for the gym as well. If you're also doing personal training, um, we don't have small group fitness and a big part of that is like, just the facility is not like, we need just a little bit more space for that. I think, um, we've toyed around with that. Like, you know, I think we're, we are doing one strength class a week with Aaron on Saturdays, which is really cool. But like, for the most part, we're just trying to keep it simple. You know, um, there are a lot of places in Atlanta doing really, really good group fitness experiences. And I think to compete with that, we would need to like really dedicate like half the gym to that for those classes. And then if you're a gym member, that's going to limit your, you know, access and stuff like that. So we're just, we're keeping it simple, personal training, gym, you can do either, you can do both. And the facility, is it a, is it 24 hours? Is it posted hours? What does that look like? Yeah, it's 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. So it's close to 24 hours. But, you know, if you like to work out in the middle of the night, you're going to have to go somewhere else. You're going to have to go to Snap Fitness, guys. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, isn't there isn't there a Snap Fitness in uh, in Inman? There is. Yeah. Like, and right Inman Park. Park. It's a much smaller footprint than uh, the Glenwood one. Glenwood one is nice. I like it. Yeah, it's the one that I've liked the best that I've ever been in, really, because it's kind of open. Yeah, totally. Um. Okay. So as far as training collective, I mean, it sounds like, do you, do you have the, are you same, same partners on that side of the business? Or are you completely in business? No. With somebody else? Yeah, it's a different partner. Um, he kind of came in as an investor role and he's been really awesome to work with, you know, um, it was kind of a new, I knew him through yoga primarily, like we met on a yoga retreat. Um, but yeah, it's been a cool kind of uh, side project for both of us. And we're learning a lot as we go, obviously, and learning a lot about being partners too, which is cool. Yeah. Well, I want to respect your time. I really appreciate you making the time up to this point and uh, being willing to open and uh, and talk about things that I don't know that you thought you were going to be talking about today. Nope. And so <laughs> I think that um, I think that it's beautiful that you're willing to do that and and kind of in the moment I can see it on your face. Like I don't know if I want to necessarily go down this path, but here we are. Um, I'll do and, it. Yeah. <laughs> and and I really appreciate you being willing to do that because I think that that your candor. And your willingness to be open might just spark something in somebody else to chase something they want to do or to be accepting of a situation that right now today might be doom. Right now today might be clouds everywhere, can't see out of this. But you being willing to talk about where maybe there was some time in your life where you've been there, right? And even with COVID then happening, like everything kind of freaking out, you're here, you're alive, you're present, you're mindful, you're going into classes, you're working out, you're moving your body, you're mothering, you're being a partner. Like there's so many things that you're doing today that had you not, I don't want to say kept, kept the faith, right? That's not really like you, had you not had some sort of guiding light or some sort of direction that you were trying to go, that you were willing to, to stay on the path for, you probably wouldn't be here, right? With the success that you've had or the lessons that you've had. And so I really appreciate you being willing to go down that. Of course. Happy to share. Hope it helps someone out there. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me.
Absolutely. Where can the people find you? Where can they uh, get plugged into what what you're about, your various studios and everything else that's going on? And feel free to even plug that that side pro that side side project that you have that we oh, didn't really talk gosh. about if you want. Yeah. So um, I guess my website, you can kind of see all I need to update it more than I do. But like you can see the stuff I've got going on. It's just lcbrotherton.com. Um, and then obviously Highland Yoga, follow us on social media, come check out a studio. You can even like send me a DM and I'll hook you up with a free intro month. Um, training collective, uh, we're on Instagram. Um, it's just trainingcollective.com for the website there. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, my other side business <laughs> that you mentioned, it's uh, called Wander Bar and it is a 1970s camper that has four keg taps and it serves like any drink that you want. So it's great for like your margaritas or your mimosas. Um, and so I just started out with a friend just for fun. And we're pretty busy this fall, but we do have some openings for the holidays. So check it out. Wanderbar.fun. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. You can follow me on social media, LC Yoga. Heck yeah. Well, I'll link all that in the uh, the show notes. So you'll be able to just one click and uh, go to anything that she just said. And we'll rock and roll from there. Elsie, if you'll hold on just two seconds, I'm going to stop the recording. And thank you, everyone that listened to this up to this point. It's been right there at an hour. And uh, we appreciate your time.